In this Dream to Explain tutorial, we're gonna learn how to work with nodes. Now before we begin, let's get the terminology straight. In Dream to Explains, when we make a spline, it consists of points. These points are called control points. I'm saying this because when people talk about splines, they can sometimes call these control points nodes. And that's also valid, but in Dream Tech Splines, the node is actually a component. To create a node, we go to Game Object, 3D Object, and Spline Node. If we have a spline selected, it's going to ask us if we want to make it a child of the spline. In this case, I'm gonna say no, and this is going to create a new node in the scene. In Dream Tech Splines, the node is a component that binds a spline control point to a game object in the scene. This is useful when you want to animate splines. In this case, you would animate the object with the nodes and the spline is going to be updated. Or you can use physics or just move an object in the scene via script and have the spline respond to it. So to bind a control point to this node, we go to the node and then we drag the spline which we want to bind to this node. Now we need to choose a point that we want to link. I can do that either by clicking one of these circles here with the numbers or I can also use the drop-down menu to select the point number. I prefer to do that visually, so I'm gonna click point number 3. Click yes. And because this is the first spline connected to the node, it's going to ask me if I want to snap and align the node, just snap the node or don't snap the node at all. If I click no, then point 3 is going to move to the node. If I click snap, then the node is going to move to point 3, so that the spline is preserved. And if I click snap and align, this is also going to rotate the node in the direction of the spline. I'm gonna go with snap and align. Now if I move the node object, you can see that the spline also gets updated. To better visualize this, let's add a path generator to the spline. Now let's go back to the node and take a look at the options that we have. Inside the connections panel, we can see that we have connected the spline called spline at point 3. If I click select, this is going to select the spline object itself. I can also remove it by clicking this button with the X. And moving down, we have three checkboxes, which are transform normals, transform size, and transform tangents. If you leave this on, transform normals will make sure that the normals of the spline are also rotated when you rotate the node, and the point sizes are also scaled when you scale the node. If you disable them, this is not gonna happen. And transform tangents does the same, if your spline is of type busier. I'm gonna go back to that in a minute. Another use for nodes is also to connect splines together. So if I duplicate this spline and maybe edit it a little, just so it's different, I can create another node. Let's rename it first. And then make another node, call it node 1. And now I can drag both splines, one after each other. First I'm gonna drag the first spline and select the endpoint here, yes and yes, and then I'm going to drag the second spline and select the first point. There we go, and now if I move the node, both splines are updated. Now what you're probably noticing, because it's way too obvious, is that there is a nasty gap here between the two splines. This is because both splines are currently using the cadmium ROM mode. And cadmium ROM will just continue in the last direction of the point, but if we want to make this smooth, we can switch to busier. So I'm gonna go to spline 1. Actually, I'm gonna select both splines. Go to the spline computer panel, hit busier. And this is gonna ask me if I want to convert the cadmium ROM to busier. Yes. And now we have a smooth transition. Now, because it's busier, when I select the node, I get additional handles, which allow me to modify the tangents. And so this is where the transform tangents checkbox comes in. If I have this on, Rotating and scaling the node is going to change the tangents as well. If I turn it off, well, this is not gonna happen. Currently the node type is set to smooth, which in busier mode is very useful because it generates a seamless transition. Even if I scale it down or rotate it, this is going to make sure that both splines are ending and beginning in the same way. If I disable smooth, however, and leave it to free, I can go inside each spline and freely modify the tangents. And now I can have this ugly gap again, if I so desire. Nodes are also accessible through code and can be used for a bunch of behaviors, but I'll get to that in a minute. Let's first do something more exciting. Let's delete all of the objects and create a physics-driven rope. For this purpose, I'm gonna create a new spline computer. 
Here I'm going to switch the placement mode from Y plane to Z plane. And just to make it easier for me so that I don't have to create nodes manually and add the splines to them, I will click the create node checkbox here in the spline creation tool. Then I'm going to create a bunch of points and creating each point is also going to create a node and bind this node to this point. When I'm done, I can exit creation mode. And what I can do now is I can select all the points, go into point operations, hit flat X to make them flat in a straight line and also distribute evenly, which is going to place the points at even distances. Now let's go to the spline object and see the nodes created. In order to create the row behavior, I'm gonna have to put them in a hierarchy and then select all nodes, add rigid bodies to them, make the first one kinematic, select all nodes, add capsule colliders and set them up. Add a hinge joint component, check use limits and for each node link the previous one in the rigid body field. Leave the first one empty. Now let's visualize the rope. We can use a tube generator for that. Here it is and what I can do is use round caps and maybe reduce the size of the tube. So I think we're done. If I hit play and select one of the nodes and move it, we have this wiggly rope. Which looks rather unsettling, but I'm sure you can tweak it way better than I can. I think we can now move on to some coding. I created a scene with three splines connected by a node in the middle, here, and a spline follower which follows the main spline. However, if I press play, what is going to happen is the follower is just going to keep following the main spline every single time I play the scene. This is because currently there is no logic telling the follower to change its behavior once the node is reached. So that's why I made this new script called route switch and I attached it to the spline follower here. And just to save time I added the using dreamtext splines, a follower variable and the get component call here. So you don't have to look at me doing that over again and we can begin. So the follower has an event which gets fired when the follower passes a node. This event is called on node and we can subscribe to it like this. Now we need to define this method. In Visual Studio we can do so by pressing Ctrl and dot and it's going to offer us an implementation of it. So now we can see that on node passed takes an argument which is a list of spline tracer node connection objects. We are using a list because in some edge cases the follower might be moving way too fast and in doing so it could pass more than one node along the way. And nodes in this list are going to be added in the order of passing. But because our follower is not moving that fast, and I'm currently not expecting edge cases like that, for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna go and use the first element of this list. Now if we take a look into the node connection object, we can see that it has two fields. One is the node, which is a direct reference to the node component. And the other one is the index of the spline point to which the node is connected relative to the current spline. So just to test if this works, we can add a log. Now when I press play, we should have an entry in the console. There we go, and it sounds about right. Because right now we're on the main spline, and the node is connected at the fourth point, so it's 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so let's see what other information we can get out of this node connection object. For example, we can also get the percent of the point along the spline. We can do so using some simple math. By casting the point index to double and dividing it by the point count of the spline minus one. So because this is the fourth point and the spline consists of six total points, the percent of this point should be 60%. And there we go, 0 0.6. Now let's move on and see how we can get the rest of the connected splines and pick one at random to continue with. For this, I'm gonna need to get the reference to the node. So node connection, node, and I need to use the get connections method. This method returns a node that connection object, actually an array of it. And if we check out the connection object, we can see that it holds a reference to the spline 
the point index that the spline is connected at, as well as some additional information that is used by the node. Like for example, this spline point is the representation of the control point inside the node so that I can use it to transform the connected splines. But for this example, we're gonna stick with the spline property and the point index. So let's list the connected splines. We're gonna do a for loop. Like this, and let's run the game. Take a look at the console. And we can see that we have three splines connected, which are spline main at point three, we already know that spline left at point zero and spline right at point zero. So these two are connected in the beginning, this one is connected in the middle. To make the follower switch splines, we simply need to pick one of these splines at random and assign it to the follower. So let's delete the for loop, get a random index, and we can set the new spline like so. So this alone is enough to make the follower switch splines, but this is not gonna look good. You'll see in a second, the follower is actually going to jump. See, as soon as it switched to the spline right, it actually jumped to about here and continued from there. Why is this happening? Well, because the spline follower holds a percent, and each spline is evaluated using this percent. At the point of reaching the node, the follower is at about 60% of the current spline. So when you swap the spline, with another one, you will teleport the spline follower at the new spline's 60% point, which in this case is about here. Luckily, there are helpful methods that are going to help us fix this. We can use the follower set percent and pass zero to it. This is going to reset the follower to the beginning of the spline, but this unfortunately is not going to work because if the randomization picks the same spline, being the main spline, what's gonna happen is the follower is going to teleport to the beginning of this spline. So we need to find out the distance that the follower is past the node, get this distance and preserve it when switching to the new spline. We already know the percent of the node right here. And we can also get the percent of the follower along the spline, which we can do like this. However, keep in mind that result percent will be a percent local to the clip range of the follower. So in order to translate this to global spline percentage, we can call a handy method called unclip percent. We also have the clip percent method, which is going to do the opposite. It's going to take global spline percentage and convert it to the percentage inside the clip range of the follower. And so now that we have the node percent along the spline and the follower percent along the spline, we can actually calculate the distance between them in world units. We can do so using the calculate length method. And so now that we have the distance, we also need to find the node percent of the new spline. So in this case, the node percent for the spline left and right is going to be zero and the node percent for the main spline is going to be 60 or 0 0.6. We've already done this for the current spline, but we also need to do it for the selected new spline. So we use the connections array, pass in the RND index, access the point index, and then divide it by the spline point count of the new spline, minus one. And finally, to get the new percent, we can use the travel method, which moves along a spline with world units and returns the new percent. We're gonna pass in the new node percent as a starting point. Then we need to pass the distance past node as the distance we need to travel. And finally, for the direction of travel, we're gonna use the follower's direction. And so that's it. We just need to pass the new percent here instead of zero and hit play and see what happens. Whoops. Well, maybe if we move the start position a little bit back. So this is how we use the onNode event. And you can see just how much information we can get simply by using the node information and the follower results. For more elaborate junctions usage, check out the junctions example provided in the package. 
We have this train demo, which not only picks different junctions based on their angles, but also has wagons that also follow at a given distance, preserving the distance all the time throughout different splines. And the way this demo is set up is if you go here, we have the nodes once again, but in each node object, we have this junction switch script. And the junction switch script defines rules for picking the right spline. And on the train engine object, we have this train engine component, which uses the junction switch script to make its choice. But the core principle of work is the same. We have this on junction handler, which if you take a look is subscribed to the on node event. So the whole logic happens here. It's just a little bit more elaborate. You can use it as a starting point for something more complex. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.